means that fair housing for all, all human beings, is now a part of the American way of life. prevent discrimination, but to actually affirmatively go out and say, how do we desegregate America, except the government betrays that policy. I find as I travel across the country that uh, uh, whether we're talking about the white Americans or people who may be uh, not Negro, but in other minority groups like the Mexican Americans, the rest, uh, just like the black Americans, what everybody wants is an equal chance to have a piece of the action. The federal government has never enforced the Fair Housing Act, and that state and local governments do not enforce the Fair Housing Act. And so, again, you know, you can have federal policy, but it's the local administration of these policies that often meant that black people received discriminatory treatment. Hello, my name is Tyrone Washington. I'm calling about the apartment on Park Street. It's not available. Yes, hello, my name is Graham Wellington. I'm calling about the apartment for rent on Park Street. Is that still available? Yes, it is. What oh, is? Yes. Really? And so what does this mean? It means that the places that were segregated in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they're still racially segregated today because we haven't done anything to undo the racial segregation. Oh, yeah, what it have today is uh, over 95% white. Uh, very few minority families living there. We didn't fix the damage that was done. We just allowed all those inequalities to continue, but said from this day forward, we can't discriminate. So it didn't fix it. All these policies and practices, these systems that federal government, state government, and local government pass and enact, they converge to sort of create concentrated poverty by the time we reach the 50s and 60s. So that creates a situation where in many urban areas you had like what George Clinton would call, you know, chocolate cities and the vanilla suburbs. Oh, what's happening, CC? They still call it the White House, but that's a temporary condition. There's a lot of chocolate cities uh, around. We've got New York, we've got Gary. Somebody told me we got LA. And we're working on Atlanta. Hey, uh, we didn't get our 40 acres in a uh, view. But we did get you. that were heavily concentrated with African Americans. Garbage collection wasn't picked up as frequently. Streets weren't repaired as well. Conditions deteriorated. The urban areas became slums. Yeah, I would like to rub America's nose in this and say, take a look at it. If they want to reject it, go ahead. But I certainly would, would hate to think that anybody thought I said they were giving up hope. What I'm really saying is that society has failed the hope of the people who live here and struggle here. That's what I'm really saying. They're going to go on struggling anyway, whether we fail or succeed. But at the same time, you have concentration. You also have clearance. You have highway construction, which is destroying black communities. Highways, oftentimes in urban areas, are built dead in the middle of black communities. So there's a sort of rising anger or frustration that takes place. 
once they became slums, authorities looked at them and said, well, we need to do some slum clearance. Well, those African-American families who were displaced uh, had to move somewhere. So those families were given Section 8 housing vouchers. The idea behind Section 8 is fabulous. It's, it's exactly what one would hope, is that people who are impoverished have an opportunity to move into neighborhoods that are not impoverished. Unfortunately, for black Americans, it doesn't work that way. A large reason for that is, is you can still legally discriminate against someone for using a Section 8 voucher. So landlords in most suburbs would not accept Section 8 housing vouchers. And that's perfectly legal. White homeowners deathly afraid of a black person moving next to them because blackness is associated with lower home values. We fear your presence in the neighborhood can undermine the value of our homes, and we're concerned. We'd like you to move out before it becomes common knowledge that there's a Negro family in the area. It's nothing personal. Oh, it never is. If it was personal, well, I'd feel real bad. We grew up in Philadelphia, actually, originally, and we were in an all-black neighborhood, and my life changed when we moved to South Jersey, not far from some of the Levittown type of neighborhoods. And when we came in, the police had to come in with us because people were uh, throwing things at our house and terrorizing our house at night. We moved there because we wanted a place that was integrated and we just wanted to raise our standard of living. And it was the strength of my parents that said, this is where we're going to be. Do you think a Negro family moving here will affect the community as a whole? Definitely. In what way? I think that well, the property values will immediately go down if uh, they are allowed to move in here in any number. Do you think the Myers staying in Levittown will affect property values? Uh, I don't think that the Myers have anything to do with the um, property decreasing or increasing. I think it's purely a white problem, not a Negro problem. Well, as a result of all these policies, we created a segregated system. And because we've forgotten now this entire history of how it happened, white families believe that they got where they are simply by their own hard work and determination to succeed in a middle-class life. What they don't understand is that their parents could have came as an immigrant from a white country and immediately had access to loans and the ability to move into white neighborhoods that black Americans whose families had been citizens for generations could not. And so it's not saying that their families didn't work hard, but it is saying that their families benefited from a great deal of affirmative action to get where they are.